All right. Tonight, we are going to talk about personal finance, okay? So as I always introduce this topic, this is not business finance. This isn't about what companies do. I know that we've been talking for the last six lectures about, um, about business, about entrepreneurship, about the economy, about the country. Tonight, we're talking about your wallet. Okay, so nothing to do with business. Please don't confuse this topic with business. This is about your personal finance. So we are gonna talk tonight about things like retirement. And you might be sitting here saying, Mr. Conti, retirement. I'm 20 years old. You're gonna talk to me about retirement? Um, but I am, and I'm gonna tell you why. Okay, so I'll start by telling you why. When I was 21, and I got my very first job, that big boy job, okay, that came with a 401k. I had no idea what a 401k was. And I didn't want to look like a fool to my new employer that just hired me. So, you know, I took this paperwork home and I kind of tried to figure it out and I made some decisions on this form that literally to this day still impact me, luckily in a good way, okay? I don't want you guys to be the, that person. Um, I want you to truly understand what a 401k is, what an IRA is, um, what your money does for you, where your money physically is going, um, how it accrues interest, all this kind of stuff. Tonight I want to talk about the stock market. I want you to understand it. I want to talk about bonds. I want you to understand the difference between a stock and a bond. Um, what I really want to talk about tonight, which is the last couple topics, is mutual funds which you guys are my absolute favorite type of investment, mutual funds. I wanna talk a lot about what mutual funds do, okay? Um, but then before that, I wanna talk about really basic stuff like, what is a bank? I know that sounds like completely stupid, but like, what is a bank? How do they make money? Um, what different types of banks are out there? What kind of bank should I bank with? What's a credit card? Should I have a credit card? Why do credit cards benefit me? Um, I'm a big fan of credit cards and I wanna to talk to you about why, okay? So that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. All things having to do with personal finance. Sound good? All right. For, for the viewing audience at home, everybody says yes. <laughs> All right, so first let's just talk about banks, okay? So I know this sounds silly like, Mr. Conti, I know what a bank is. You walk into a bank, you deposit money, take out money, but First of all, do you understand that there are two kinds of banks, okay? Two big umbrellas of banks. Depository institutions or depository banks and non-depository institutions or non-depository banks, right? I wanna start the lecture by talking about depository banks. We'll get to the non in a minute. Okay, so first of all, a bank is, is, a, is an institution that accepts deposits that then they take and circulate, okay? Is everybody clear that when you put $100 in the bank, the bank does not hold on to all $100? Do you get that? It's a weird concept, right? Like, if I wanna go back to the bank tomorrow and take my $100 back, can I? Yeah. Of course but you're physically not taking your $100 back, you're taking somebody else's. It's a weird concept, I'm gonna show you a visual for in a second. The bank only holds on to a small piece of its deposit in its reserve. It takes a majority of the money that it gets from deposits and it does stuff with it. I'll show you in a second if you don't know, it makes money with your money on your behalf. And by the way, depository institutions reward you for putting your money in the bank by paying you what? Interest. Interest, exactly, okay? And by the way, the, in, the amount of interest that you make is dependent on the amount of interest that the bank can charge for money, for lending money, okay? So as a saver, man, we want interest rates to be high. As a borrower, we want interest rates to be low. Agree? And that's the fine balance that uh, the U.S. Treasury and the Fed balance, okay? We want to encourage people to save, but we really want to encourage people to spend, okay, and borrow. We're going to talk about that. Okay, so does everybody understand what a depository institution is? It accepts checking and savings deposits and then lends that money to borrowers. And I'll show you what I mean in one second. I have a little chart to give you a sense of 
where your hundred dollars is going if you were to deposit that in the bank. But there are four types of depository institutions. And I wanna go over just what makes each one a little bit different. But what I need you to understand before we even go into the four is that all four of these types of banks, I'll give you an example for each, all four of these guys um, take deposits and lend depositors money for different things. And by the way, the number one thing that banks, depository banks lend money for is mortgages. Everybody clear about that? It's really the number one way that maybe three out of these four banks make money is to lend money for mortgages. They take your money, the depositor, and they lend that money for mortgages. What is a mortgage? I know most of you know. A house, loan for? House loan. Exactly, for real estate, right? Okay, so now I wanna get into the nitty gritty of what makes each of these different types of banks different. They're all depository institutions, so they all take in deposits and lend money for various reasons, but here's what makes each one different. Okay, so and, uh, let me come back here in one second. Number one, commercial bank. Okay, so Chase, you all know JP Morgan Chase Bank, but I'm only talking now about the Chase side. Chase is a commercial bank. Okay, so what does Chase Bank do? Can you and me go into a bank, you and I, uh, and open up a checking and savings account at Chase, and can we deposit money at Chase, and can Chase use our money to lend for homes and cars and boats and credit cards? Yes, agree? Yeah. Okay, here's what makes a commercial bank a commercial bank. And don't worry about, about this bullet. It invests in the stock market. It buys and sells stocks and bonds, okay? I'm gonna say it a different way, kind of a little bit of a confusing way. A commercial bank has a non-depository side to it. That means absolutely nothing to you right now. It will in a few slides when I explain to you what a non-depository bank is, but I kind of just did, okay? So J.P. Morgan Chase, they do all the same things that all the other banks do. They accept deposits, they lend money for homes and cars and boats and credit cards, but they also invest in the market. That's what makes it a commercial bank. They have a, an investment bank side to it, okay? That's number one. Number two, and stop me with questions, okay? You're gonna, I, I promise you, you're gonna have lots of questions tonight. Personal questions about should I, shouldn't I, can I? Um, one of Susie Orman's uh, parts of her TV show is can I, Susie, can I afford this? Um, and so we can play that game if you want tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, okay, number two is what's called an S&M. Not to be confused with Saturday Night Live, that's a TV show. This is S and L, all right? So an SNL bank um, primarily makes its money based on mortgages, okay? That is the primary way that these banks make money. So it should be no surprise that in 2007, 8, 9, you all know I love to talk about 2007, 8, 9, yeah? The, you know, the mini economic meltdown that we had, it should be no surprise that 80, one American banks went out of business, and you know what type of banks they were? S and L. The biggest one, uh, uh, why did they go out of business? The biggest one was Countrywide Mortgage. Countrywide Mortgage was one of the largest banks in the United States. It was a savings and loan association. The majority of the way these banks make their money is to take in deposits from depositors like you and me and lend for real estate loans. What year was mortgage? It? Oh, uh, seven, eight, or nine. Probably, probably eight was the year that they went out of business. Okay, but I'm just my point that I'm trying to make is that when the real estate market goes south, these types of banks have a harder time. Okay, why? Because of foreclosures on real estate property. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, and then here's another example. Capital One is a, an SNL, uh, and so is Inwood. Na Do you all know Inwood National Bank? It is a tiny little local Dallas bank. I think there's like three branches. There's one right across the street from my house. I look at that bank and I'm like, who the hell banks there? But do you know why these little mom and pop banks actually do well? Do you know why you would bank at a little itty bitty bank that has only three ATMs that you can barely access your money at? Because they don't take, uh, they don't withdraw as much. Okay, good answer. Yeah, that's part of it. 
structure and so yeah. maintaining the business probably would cost a lot. Okay, so lower overhead, what do you think they do with that lower overhead? They reinvest it. Okay, and what you're getting is that they pass that savings on to the consumer. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so here's the deal. You know, when you're a JP Morgan Chase and you have an ATM on every block, you know, in the world, right? Um, you're not really incentivized to pay your depositors as much interest. But when you're a smaller bank, and man, it's kind of a pain in the ass to bank with you, you gotta give incentives to be competitive. You gotta give consumers a reason to bank with us. And the reason is they pay more. They pay more. Are you with me? A lot of online only banks pay more interest. Why? Because it's less convenient to bank with them, right? There's no ATM to go to to withdraw your money. It's not as convenient. Um, but these banks will generally pay higher interest rates to savers. So bear that in mind if you're thinking about, if you don't have a bank account or you're thinking about opening up a new one or moving your money. Okay, number three. Number three is called a mutual savings bank. And this is super interesting. I think this, this format of banking is crazy interesting, okay? So I just explained to you with number one and number two, with a commercial bank and with a mutual savings bank, the banks pay you interest. Does everybody understand that? You deposit $100 in the bank and the bank is gonna pay you interest. What is that interest based on? The bank, pay, how much are banks paying these days interest on putting 100 bucks in the bank? How much interest, does anybody know? Uh, maybe on your checking account, it's really crappy, like 0 0.01, right? But not on savings. In fact, savings interest rates are quite high, relatively high right now. And I'll give you, I'll tell you a couple of banks out there that you should look at if you're looking for a good savings account. But hold that thought. But how much is the typical rate right now? Does anybody know? Two or three. Um, oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> under two, honestly, or just barely 2%. Okay, for a typical regular savings account, we're gonna talk about CDs later, um, not compact music discs, that's a different CD. I still have a million of those, we can talk about that. Yeah, you too? I don't wanna get rid of them. They're like, you know, they're like my babies from the 90s. They can be vintage yeah. later. What's that? They can be vintage later. I know, you're right, exactly. Now, I would pay somebody to burn them all for me, but that's another story. To not burn, not physically burn, I mean like transfer them oh, yeah, digitally. Okay. Not physically yeah. burn them like transfer them to something digital. But anyway, okay, so. Like a bootleg. There you go, yeah. yeah. Like a bootleg MP3 format, right? right? I didn't um, even think about fire, like I was like. Yeah, no, good, of course not, oh. no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, back to the conversation for the sake of YouTube, okay? Mm -hmm. So, mutual savings banks actually don't pay a traditional interest rate. Okay, Mr. Conti, then why the hell would I want to bank with a mutual savings bank? because instead of paying an interest rate, the mutual savings bank treats all of its depositors, you and me, it doesn't matter how much money we have in, in a bank like this, as co-owner of the bank. You own part of the bank, okay? It's called cooperative banking. And instead of paying you an upfront fixed interest rate, like Chase right now will tell you, we pay 2%. So for every 100 bucks you put in the bank, we're gonna pay you two bucks a year, okay? These banks, um, their rate of return varies, and instead of it being an interest rate, it is a dividend. A dividend is like what you get when you own shares of stock in a company, and the company will pay you a dividend based on how well it's doing. Well, this is the same concept. The bank will pay you a dividend based on how well the bank is doing, okay? And obviously, the larger the savings account that you have, the bigger the dividend is going to be. It's, it's um, it is in proportion to how much money you have invested in that bank, okay? And people always ask me, like, do you have to be wealthy to bank in a bank? Like, no, you can open a savings account with whatever the minimum is, a penny, I guess, a dollar, whatever, however you want to open a savings account. What's the same dividend? So instead of, let's say you're banking at a Chase, and Chase says, um, Karina, we, we pay 2%, that's our, our APR right now, that is our percentage rate, okay? So that's a fixed rate, right? You are guaranteed to make 2% return at Chase, a commercial bank. At a mutual savings bank, instead of a interest rate, you're gonna get a dividend. A dividend is basically like your share of the bank's profit. And it varies. It will vary based on how well the bank does. Now, hold on, wait a minute. I asked a question earlier and you guys didn't answer. My question was, what does the interest rate depend on? 
So when a bank pays you an interest rate, 2% right now, what does that rate depend on? Why would that rate go up or down? Why would the bank pay you more or less? The market. Well, that's, that's a good answer. And actually, yes, the larger the account you have, oftentimes the more money you have, maybe the, the better the rate will be. That is true. Um, but not exactly. You said market. What does that mean? fluctuation of rates depending upon, I guess, the economy? Kind of, and that would be more true, let me just go back to my last slide, here, where commercial banks are actually impacted by things like the stock market, the stocks, stocks and bonds, sure, but not here. What about the amount of bankers? How, like how many, how many depositors there are? Yeah. Okay, all right. Is there an inflation part of it? Kind of. There's one simple answer, so remind me, how does the bank make money? Loaning it. Uh huh. And charging? A percentage. And then right. You get a percentage of that percentage. Okay. Yes. So, answer my question. What affects the bank's willingness to pay you a interest rate on your savings? Lack of loans. Uh huh. The bank's ability to charge interest, right? So, the more interest the bank charges for borrowers, the more interest it's going to pay to savers, right? The lower the bank is charging borrowers, the lower banks are going to charge savers, right? Or pay savers. Think about it. Right now, you could apply for a mortgage at a typical bank. The bank is only going to charge you, if you have good credit, we'll look at this in a second, for a mortgage, 4%, 5%, 6%, 7%. That's pretty low right? That's only for every thousand dollars you're going to borrow 70 bucks or 60 bucks or 50 bucks or 40 bucks. That's pretty low. So banks aren't going to pay you very much, right? Interest rate wise. But as those rates go up, the bank will give you a bigger incentive to save your money. Why? What does the bank want to do? Well, let me go to the slide I just skipped. What does the bank want to do? Here's your hundred bucks that you deposit in the bank. Here's 10 of those hundred dollars that the bank is holding on to. What's the bank doing with 90% of your dollars? Lending it. Lending it. Do you guys get that? The bank is lending it, okay? So the bank wants to give you incentive to keep that money there, to not withdraw, right? Because the longer you keep your money in, the more the bank can use your money to make money. And when you're making money, the bank's making a lot more money. Got it? So the bank is gonna pay you an interest rate um, relative to the interest rate the bank is charging to borrow money, okay? So, it pays to be a saver, yeah? Savers make money, and savers help the bank make money. Okay, how are we doing? So, first of all, four kinds of banks. What kinds of banks are we talking about? What's the big umbrella? All of the banks we're talking about right now are what kind of banks? Beautiful, depository banks. A simple term that means that depositors deposit money and that the bank lends that money, okay? So we talked about commercial banks that have an investment side. We talked about savings and loan banks that just primarily make their money based on mortgages, home loans. And then we just talked about mutual savings banks that treat depositors like they are part owners of the bank. And instead of paying those depositors an interest rate, a percent, it pays the depositors dividends, a piece of the bank's profit, okay? And that just depends on how much the bank has. You got it. Depends on like the financial health of that bank. And it you could, got it. It could be like weekly or something? I mean. Um, it is generally monthly, just like your bank will pay you a monthly APR interest rate. It's generally a monthly dividend. Some banks will do it quarterly, just the way stock, the stock market does it quarterly. Sometimes it's quarterly, okay? And it is compounding interest, obviously. You make those dividends, the dividends get thrown into your savings account and you compound on uh, the interest. Okay, the last one, credit union. How many of you belong to a credit union that you're aware of? Okay, here's the first thing I want you to write down, although you may already know this, maybe you don't. A credit union is a nonprofit bank. That should sound like an oxymoron to you because the definition of bank is to make profit, right? So what the heck is a nonprofit bank? Well, it's kind of simple. This is a bank that is created by a body to benefit that body. Okay, what the hell's a body? So it could be that a town or a municipality creates a credit union. It could be that um, a workers union creates a credit union. It could be that just a corporation. When I worked for Bloomingdale's, 
our parent company, which now is called Macy's Incorporated, but it used to be called Federated Department Stores, we had our own credit union. What was it? It was a bank that only employees and their families could bank. Okay, why bank with the credit union? Well, it's simple, because it's nonprofit. So what's it gonna do? It's going to give better interest rates and it is going to give better savings rates, okay? So because it, it is poised to not make as much money, it is in the advantage of its um, bankers to bank with a credit union, okay? What kind of credit unions do you guys belong to? Um, Part of it. What is it? Texas Insurance. Okay, and well, how do you, do you know how to qualify to be in it? Well, I didn't have to, like when my, when I was younger and my mom worked for South Western Bell, um, we were a part of a credit Perfect. union. And because of the way that it worked, yep. like she would encourage me to. So you don't have to, it's not through my employer. Gotcha, but it was through moms. No, not, now Texas Trust is not. That's That was my mindset to get a credit union and not, they're one of the ones that don't, you don't have to be Understood. employed by a certain. Gotcha, okay, good. Anybody military can belong to a military credit union. Okay, so that's the best kind of bank, period, right? Because that really is designed to be at the advantage of, um, you know, service members and, and retired service members. So, what's the name of yours? Cool. Yeah. Who else? What do you What do you belong to, my friend? The neighborhood credit union. Neighborhood. Good. And that's based on the community that you live in, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Perfect. Okay. Um, there's teachers credit unions. There's corporate credit unions. There is Armed Forces Credit Union. So if you have the opportunity to belong to a credit union, you want to be because it's a non-profit, okay? It's like an exclusive club that you have to have membership in and it generally will benefit. Okay, is everybody clear what a depository institution is? Yep, okay. Now let's talk about, uh, oh, hold on. Because before we get to non-depository institution, I have to talk about this, super important. How many of you have a grandma that told you, put your money under the mattress, uh, you know, in a, in, a, in a shoe box, right? That's the best thing to do with your money. Okay, no, 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 there is no worse advice than that. Because let me explain something to you. If your house gets robbed, if your mattress burns down, if you fall asleep smoking in bed, okay? There is no way to insure, you like that one, cash. You can't do it, okay? The only way to insure cash is in a FDIC insured bank account. Let me explain to you what FDIC is. You all see the sticker at the bank when you go, right? Although, man, I don't remember the last time I've been inside a bank. There's almost no reason now to go to banks anymore, right, other than the ATM machine. But Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, this is an agency of the federal government, the Treasury, okay? That is an insurance policy. It protects banks, okay? And by the way, not branches, banks. If a bank were to go bankrupt, if a bank were to get robbed, if a bank were to burn down to the ground, if a bank were to somehow lose its money, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation covers your checking and savings accounts, okay? Not investments, let me just make that clear, okay? That's why I talk about this here and not when we get to deposit non-depository. It's only checking and savings account in depository institutions. Now, let me tell you about a law that changed. So the FDIC used to cover deposits up to $100,000. That was the old rule of thumb. So if you had your money in an account, you could put up to $100,000 in that account, don't write that number down, and you would be saved, okay? Bank burned out of the ground, 81 of those banks went out of business in 2008. Your money was covered under Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, okay? Under Obama administration, the max, the cap, rose to $250,000. Why? Because we saw that period where banks were actually bankrupting, right? They were going out of business. And so now you can put up to $250,000 in an account, um, and that's in a bank, not a branch, not multiple accounts at one bank, at a bank, okay? And your money is saved. This is why wealthy individuals who have more than $250,000 in cash, what do they do? Spread their money around to different banks, okay? In the United States, all right? Out of the United States, is it a whole other tax, tax reason? But in the United States, if you have bank accounts at Chase and Citi and Wells Fargo, it's because you want the insurance policy of the $250,000 per account. Got it? Do write that number down 
coming to a quiz or exam near you. <laughs> okay, cool. So you, so you can have it, I didn't get any of that. But you can get, uh, you can have it all, you said not a branch? Correct. So I always get the pressure like, oh, so if I go to Chase on Lemon and I go to Chase on Whitecliff, I'm cool? No, it's Chase. So Chase is an FDIC insured bank. And so you can have $250,000 in your Chase account, checking and savings, that is covered, okay? Now, we go from depository to non-depository, all right? So what is a non-depository bank? Well, it's exactly as it sounds. These are financial institutions that you cannot just deposit money and expect to accrue interest on some kind of savings account. These are what's called investment banks, okay? So an investment bank, first of all, uh, employs securities brokers. And we're gonna talk more about this later in this lecture, but a securities broker is somebody who invests on behalf of you, the investor, okay? And by the way, you do not need a securities broker to buy stocks and bonds. They're helpful, but you don't need one. You can do it self-service, and I'll explain that later too, all right? But investment banks basically help companies raise financial capital uh, by issuing securities in primary markets. So in plain English, these are banks that deal with the stock market, they buy stocks and bonds, okay? The people who physically buy the stocks and bonds are securities brokers. And um, by the way, some of these brands look familiar to you, some of them don't, okay? So here's your Chase, but now we're talking about the JP Morgan side of Chase. That's the investment bank, okay? Um, here's your Bank of America, but this is the investment bank side, all right? And then there's some other brands like Goldman Sachs that you may not have heard of. By the way, can we talk for one second about really good plain old savings accounts? I have done my research and I know what savings accounts pay on the market. Um, the best savings account, period. And by the way, you do not need more than a dollar to open this account is Goldman Sachs, and it's the, the, it's called Marcus. Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Write that down if you're looking for a, um, a high yielding savings account. So Marcus by Goldman Sachs, it's a plain old commercial bank, all right? But it's online only, so you have to be comfortable with that. Um, it's online only, so what happens is you link whatever your checking account is, whatever bank you have, to your Goldman Sachs account, and you can move money, you wire money in between the accounts. Um, this account right now is paying like closer to 3%. Um, I cannot find another bank that has a higher interest rate. Okay, try me, look for it. A lot of them that do, you're looking at a CD or you're looking at like a high yield account that requires a large minimum uh, balance. This is no balance and it pays closer to 3%. You're not gonna make more on your money just sitting in a plain savings account than Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Okay, there's one free piece of advice for you tonight. All right, I got plenty more, don't worry. Okay, everybody understand what a non-depository institution is. It's simply an investment bank, in two words. It's an investment bank, okay? So okay. you bank, so you bank with one of those? I bank with multiple banks. No, not you, but I'm like oh. one banks with, um, one would one yes exactly we're, we're practicing for business plan, plan right one would bank with an investment bank and this is how you will do things like set up your stock and bond portfolio this is also how you'll set up your retirement account take a look how many of you have a retirement account maybe through your the job you have great do you know who you are there you go that's for you okay that green dot is for you i have fidelity too i also have vanguard um, those, some of you will set these up really without even choosing it. It's just that it's the investment bank that your company uses to administer whatever retirement account they, they, they offer, okay? I'm gonna talk a lot about that in a few slides from now, retirement accounts. But those retirement accounts are administered through these um, non-depository institutions. So if you're a self-employed, you just go straight through them? Uh, yes, absolutely, and, and, and what you're getting at is the difference between a 401k and an IRA. 401k is for people who are not self-employed, IRA is for everybody, and we're going to talk about the difference in just a second. Yes, but yes, you would set up an IRA in any one of these types of accounts. And so if you okay. bank with one of those, or one banks with one of those, then yes. you can just go in there and ask them what uh, options you have to invest? 
Yes, absolutely. So they uh, employ investment bankers, and these investment bankers, their job is to advise. Their job is also to make money, okay? Um, but yes, that's their job, okay? I will give you some amazing advice that does not require the cost of an investment broker in a few slides from now, too. Because I don't think you need the advice of an investment banker, actually. I'll tell you what I mean in a minute, okay? All right, so before we get into the personal finance piece, I want you to understand something about banking, all right? So we've looked at depository institutions, we've looked at non-depository institutions, but there's actually a third kind of bank in the United States, and that is called the Fed, the F-E-D, the Fed. Have you heard of the Fed? The Fed is the bank's bank. It's just that simple. It is the bank's bank. It is the central bank of the United States, okay? Um, this isn't the part of our government that actually prints the money, that's the US Treasury. But it is uh, the agency of our government that actually distributes money. So take a look. Aren't these fun? This is brand new money that the Fed will basically uh, introduce into our economy. Isn't that nice? It gets transported in bulletproof glass. Would you like that? Mm -hmm. um, so the Fed got started um, by an act of Congress in 1933 called the Federal Reserve Act. Um, that created this central bank, the Bank of Banks, okay, or the Central Bank of the United States. You and I, we cannot open an account at the Federal Reserve. You cannot bank at the Federal Reserve. Only banks can bank at the Federal Reserve, okay? So there's that. Um, and then the only other thing I want you to know, not even for an exam, but just for your own knowledge, and so you can fight grandma at Thanksgiving when she tells you to put you know, the $100 that she's giving you for as a gift under your mattress. Um, the, the Banking Act established the FDIC. So the FDIC, one more time, is insurance. It's the only way you can insure cash, okay? Is to put your money in an FDIC insured bank. How much money can you put in one FDIC insured account? 250. 250, quarter mil, you got it, okay? Um, that, that's basically one of the jobs of the, of the banking act, okay? All right, now we're getting into the goods. This is what I have woke up this morning to talk to you about, all right? Um, we're gonna talk about personal finance, banking, which we kind of just did, we talked about banking, retirement, I wanna talk a lot about that tonight. And I want you to get into the mindset of thinking about retirement, even though you may be in your 20s or 30s, okay? Um, investing and wealth management. So we're gonna get into that. But first, my personal hero from this presentation, and that is this lady, Susie Orman. You guys, I am like the biggest groupie of Susie Orman. I've read all the books. Um, one of my favorite books of Susie Orman is called The Courage to Be Rich. She's a New York Times bestseller. I gotta tell you her story, though I may have told you on the first day. Susie, at 30 years old, was so broke that she literally lived in her van. Did I tell you the story? No? Okay, so she lived in her van. She got a job as a diner waitress just to be around scraps of food, no joke. One day, she had a customer that she developed a relationship with, and he was a stockbroker on Wall Street. And he told her, Susie, you are so good with numbers, and you've got a really good, like, um, customer service attitude, you should think about stocks. And she actually wound up becoming one of the first stock, female stockbrokers on Wall Street. Um, okay, fast forward my story, and then all of a sudden, Oprah Winfrey discovered her. And you know, when Oprah waves her wand, good things happen, right? And so then Susie Roman wound up getting um, her own TV show on, uh, on NBC or MSNBC, I forget what, what station. And so she's become like this personal finance guru. There's a couple others out there. Um, there's some that like have like a religious spin on it. She's just straight up, don't be stupid with your money. Okay, that's like her message, all right? So there's another book that I wanna tell you about that I really like. And a lot of my information from tonight is in this book. And that book is called the Money Book for the Young, Fabulous, and Broke. Is that a good title? That is a good title, yeah? That's new, <laughs> Young, Fabulous, and Broke? All right, so a lot of the information, a lot of the advice I'm gonna give you tonight is really from this book, The Handbook for the Young, Fabulous, and Broke, all right? Um, she's also one of the most influential women in media. Um, she's worth $35 million, and I'll tell you guys, 
a lot of her advice is not get rich quick scheme. It's not like sexy, fast advice. It's actually very conservative advice, okay? She's a very conservative um, individual when it comes to money. In fact, one of her biggest investment loves is mutual uh, bonds, which I'll explain to you later. There's nothing sexy about a mutual bond, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, about a municipal bond, rather, municipal bond. That's one of her favorite investments, municipal bonds. I'll explain. Okay, so we're gonna go on a six step journey to your wealth. Do you wanna learn how to be a wealthy individual in six easy steps? I'm here to show you that right now, okay? Step number one is as basic as it gets, which is to manage your credit. So I just wanna talk for a minute about what the heck your credit is, okay? So look, once upon a time, an organization called Fair Isaac Company, write that down, coming to a quiz or an exam near you, um, came up with this kind of brilliant, although slightly frightening and very big brother idea that we're gonna come up with basically like a grade for all Americans, okay? Uh, a numerical grade, a score. And the score, as we know it today, is called a FICO score. FICO is short for Fair Isaac Company, FICO. F-I-C-O, Fair Isaac Company, all right? And so the score, it goes from 850 down, and it basically gives you a grade as to how responsible an individual you are managing your money, all right? So what I wanna show you is how that score is calculated. Do you all know? No, well, of course you know. Details on the banking. Beautiful, do you get your credit score from your bank for free? Beautiful, good for you, it's a great, great score. I won't say it out loud. I was about to say she showed us <laughs> It's a very great score. It is. It's a very, very great score. Uh, I'll tell you, the last time I checked, I'm not bragging, I'm just telling you, because, you know, it'd be horrible if Wade College had, like, you know, a broke-ass, uh, you know, <laughs> SOB giving this lecture. Uh, my credit score is close to perfect, like 820, 825. And that's only because I have a loan, high, a loan out higher than, like, a, that I've paid on it. Or... Yeah, yeah. And by the way, we're gonna talk about good debt. There is such thing as good debt. Not all debt is bad debt. Um, and again, credit cards, we're gonna talk, credit cards are one of the best ways to make this number go up. As long as you do it the right way, I'm gonna show you. Anyway, okay. The biggest piece of your credit score, write this down, multiple choice question, either tonight or next week, is payment history. It's simply, you paying your bills on time. And by the way, on time even technically means sometimes 30, sometimes 60 days late. It just depends on when that creditor reports you to the three credit reporting agencies. And by the way, the agencies, the big brothers that watch you pay your bills on time every month while you're sitting in your bathroom at your desk, they don't literally watch, but they watch. Um, that's not FICO. Okay, that's three other companies I'm gonna to talk to you about them in a minute, maybe the next slide. Not FICO, FICO is just the mathematical calculation of the score, okay? So, biggest chunk is just you paying your bills on time. Now, you're all adults. I don't think I have any 18 year olds in the room like I do in the morning, he's 18. Nice, okay, good, Do you all have bills? In your, not just name, but social security number. Do you all have bills, something? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yeah. Okay. Then you're building your credit by simply paying those bills on time, okay? Credit cards, utilities, cell phone, car payment, whatever you have, those things, paying those things on time every month, every year, I've been paying bills now for 30 years, mm -hmm. increases the biggest chunk of your credit score. Okay, there's that. Amounts owed. Okay, so I'm gonna skip to a different slide and come right back. Okay, I wanna to explain to you two really important components of managing your credit. Where am I going, right? Ooh, Hello Kitty, we'll talk about her in a second. Uh -huh. Debt to credit, debt to income. And I think this might've been what Karina was hinting at a minute ago, tell me if it is. Debt to credit limit, okay? So let's say, let me ask you guys, how many of you don't, do not have a credit card? How many of you don't have a credit card? Cool. Don't, I'm not gonna yell at you, don't worry. <laughs> Probably doing that because you think you're a responsible person who doesn't want to incur that kind of debt. Yeah? I'm just scared. You're just scared of it? Okay, cool. I'm here to work on that, okay? And I, don't work for, I do not work for a credit card company, all right? <laughs> so, here's a credit card. Um, am I your name? Meryl. Meryl. 
Marilyn's gonna go apply for a credit card tonight, okay? And to be honest with you, Marilyn, I don't care what credit card you apply for, I don't care what the interest rate is, it doesn't matter to me at all, okay? You think that's bad advice? No, it's not, I'll show you. Okay, <laughs> then let's say that that credit card company, Capital One, that was my first credit card. Let's say they give you a whopping $300 credit limit. Bless you, bless you, bless you. Okay? They're gonna give you a whopping $300 credit limit. All right? And by the way, this is called unsecured debt. You're gonna see that on a different slide. Do you know what that means, unsecured debt? Maribel's gonna go apply for a credit card. She's gonna give them her social. She'll probably just state what her income is, but they're not gonna verify it. I'm not telling you to lie about your income, okay? But they're probably not gonna verify it. And then they're gonna start you off with a small credit card. What does unsecured credit card mean? Unsecured debt credit card. She can use it for whatever she wants. I Meaning it's paid, but it's not prepaid. Right, that's exactly right. It means that this credit is given to you based on your holistic financial picture, um, but you're not putting any collateral up against it. Meaning it's not a prepaid card, it's not a debit card, it's a credit card that they're extending you credit on, okay? It's an unsecured debt credit card. Now, Marable's gonna think she is balling with her $300, she's <laughs> gonna go out and let's say she maxes out the sucker, okay? She spends $300 on it, okay? What is her debt to credit limit ratio? Her debt's 300, her credit limit's 300, she's got a one-to-one -one or 100% debt to credit limit ratio. And let's say that the bill comes in the mail and she decides to pay the minimum balance, which is what, $20? Yeah, right? Okay. Never do that because you'll never pay it back. Yeah, it'll take you 27 years to pay it back and now the law has to tell you that on your bill. It will take you this long to pay this bill back if you only pay the minimum. Don't buy shit you can't afford. If you're gonna go downstairs and buy a $5 sandwich, go ahead and charge that on your credit card, but then pay the thing in full at the end of the month. With me? But anyway, look back to my example. So Maribel, you're gonna max out the $300, you're gonna pay the $20, and now your balance is 280. Okay, now I'm not gonna do the math, but 280 out of 300 is almost, whatever it is, 90%. Okay, so now you have a debt to credit limit ratio of 90%, okay? That's bad. You wanna keep your balances owed. Now, if this is John Conti speaking, you want your balances owed to be zero. There's good debt. I'll give you examples of good debt. Credit card is not good debt, okay? You wanna keep your balances owed under 50%. So whatever credit limit companies are extending to you, you wanna borrow against it no more than half. With a credit card, you should be paying these bad boys in full. Bill comes in, you pay it in full as though you paid cash for the things on your credit card. Okay, but here's the problem with cash, and then I'm really gonna piss. I'm really gonna piss on debit cards. How many of you use debit cards? I'm coming for you. <laughs> you guys, I should have brought my wallet with me. Maybe I'll go grab it. Debit cards are the dumbest idea, and they are the worst use of your time. Let me explain to you why. I do not have a debit card. I have an ATM card, not a debit card. So my ATM card does not have a Visa, Master logo. I will not allow my bank to issue me a debit card. Let me explain to you why. First of all, your debit card is not linked to your credit. So when you're out there using your debit card, it is doing nothing to benefit your credit score. Number one. Number two, you're exposing your bank account to all of these different companies' computer systems, how many of them are getting hacked? Whereas at least with a credit card, you've got this 30-day window to fix something that, that gets broken. You get, a, you get a, um, a fraudulent charge, right? It's not money that's coming right out of your checking and savings account. That scares me to leave that kind of digital footprint of my checking account. I don't like that at all, all right? But the bigger issue is using your debit card does no better for you than using cash. It's a waste of time. Also, let me just jump on the bandwagon. Again, I don't, I'm not employed by a credit card company. Why not benefit from all of these cash back programs and frequent prior programs? Well, credit card companies are paying you to use their credit card. Most of them for free, okay? There's some paid credit cards that have annual fees and sometimes those are worth it. But why would you use a debit card or cash 
but it's doing absolutely nothing for you. It's not helping your credit, and it's not giving you any kind of incentive back. I rest my case. And it's exposing your checking account to fraud. I rest my case. Actually, no, I don't. I'm not done. <laughs> I just need to change it. Good. Get rid of your debit cards, put them away, lock them in your safety deposit box, get rid of them, stop using them. They're not doing any benefit for you, okay? You should be using a credit card and you should be paying that credit card in full when the bill comes. It will cost you nothing, except that you'll benefit from whatever the credit card's reward is, okay? All right, does everybody understand debt to credit limit ratio? Yeah? The credit limit is the amount of credit that the credit card or the company is offering you. The debt is the balance you're carrying. You should carry a zero balance. Use that credit card, of course, but pay it off. Carry a zero balance. Don't buy things you can't afford, okay? Now, the other thing is debt to income, all right? You also want your debt to be relative to your income. This is where a lot of very wealthy people wind up having terrible credit. They make lots of money, but then they incur a ton of debt, right? They over, uh, they over finance themselves. Let me tell you, you can be a poor individual and have excellent credit, and you can be a wealthy individual and have really shitty credit, okay? If you overextend yourself, don't buy things you can't, that you, that you can't afford. Okay, so how are we? Biggest piece of your credit calculation, you pay your bill on time every month, month after month, year after year. By the way, I told you I'm not off my soapbox when it comes to credit cards. Let me give you one other reason why a credit card is good. Um, that credit card bill comes in the mail, and what do you do? Pay it. So that credit card is also helping you here. Payment history, okay? Never, listen to me, never, 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 never close a credit card. Are you with me? I had to. The only reason you would have to is if you no longer use that account because it's not here or something and the credit card goes stale. And so the account, the account calls you and says, we're deeming your account inactive and they close your account. But that's them closing it. You should never, ever, ever close a credit card account. Why not? Well, let's think about this. First of all, the longer you have this credit card, I'm just using a pie as a credit card, uh, Maribel, you apply for that credit card, they gave you $300. The bill comes in the mail, you pay it. The bill comes the next month, you pay it. The bill comes the third month, you pay it. What's the credit card company gonna do? Increase your They're gonna, sometimes they ask, hey, may I increase your credit? And the answer is always, F yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> or sometimes they just do it automatically. And so now all of a sudden, your limit is $600. Now watch. If you are carrying that $300 balance, remember Maribel maxed out her card the first month and she only, now, take a look. That $300 debt that you have is 300 out of $600 available credit. So now it's a one to two debt to credit limit ratio. See that? Same amount of debt, but we have more credit. But here's the deal. Maribel's a good girl and she paid the bill in full. So now we have $600 available credit, right? That increases your credit score. Now, back to this for a second though. Never, never, never close a credit card account. Why not? Because we want months and months and years and years of history of on time payments. Yeah. What if you don't use it? So I had that problem with Bloomingdale's. I had a Bloomingdale's store card. Yeah. And we don't have Bloomingdale's here. We don't have Saks here anymore. So with that kind of thing, the worst advice I can give you is, you know, buy something just to buy it. That's sometimes we just let those accounts close. I let my Bloomingdale's account close. I there's no Bloomingdale's, okay? I and then for you, know. sex. I was on the eighth floor in New York doing some damage. Yeah, so yeah. I had to like let yeah. go. But <laughs> I'm glad you said that because remember what your credit score is. So many people argue, oh, it's so not fair. It's discriminatory. It hurts. Your credit score is a grade given by three big brothers, I'll show you who they are, not FICO, okay? But it's a grade of how responsible you are with your payment, with you know, keeping your balances down, right? With the type of credit that you have in use. And then by the way, let me just tell you one quick thing important. Maribel, can I ask you? Are you 
thinking about getting a credit card now. Yes? Okay. So now I was gonna go online. By the way, how many of you are thinking about opening a Goldman Sachs Marcus by Goldman Sachs? Raul, awesome. Yeah, Jennifer. All right. I am selling and not making money. Beautiful, good. Believe me. Move, you got some savings, move it to that account, you'll make more money. But, um, Maribel, so you're gonna go online and you're gonna apply for a credit card and you're gonna get approved for a credit card. And by the way, if you don't get approved, I've got a solution for you too. If any of you have ever applied for a credit card and not gotten approved, I've got a solution for you. But let's say you get approved. Guess what's gonna happen to your credit score? So Maribel said up and Jennifer said down. Yeah. Which one is it? Good down for the first month or two. Yeah, why? Mr. Conti, how could you give me advice to make my credit score go down? So here's the deal. Anytime you have brand new credit on your credit report, okay? Brand new credit, a student loan, a, a car, a credit card. Creditors don't know yet what your track record is. Are you gonna max this sucker out and never pay it back? Or are you gonna keep your balance at zero but use it every month and pay on time? We don't know yet. So your 700 credit score could go down by 70 points, 10%, 630. Okay, that kind of that's kind of messed up, isn't it? But eventually your score will skyrocket because what are you gonna do every month? Pay it on and you're gonna pay it on time. Okay. Credit cards are a great way of getting your credit score to increase quickly. I'm not telling you to be irresponsible with them. I'm not telling you to buy stuff you don't need. Buy a sandwich downstairs for five bucks. Get the bill in the mail and pay the five bucks in full. And you'll be doing a world of good for your credit versus using the debit card, which does nothing. Come in. So my credit card is under my LLC, so that has nothing to do with my Yeah, yeah. So I need to get a credit card in you do, yes. You need to get one attached to your social security number, your credit, yes. So what is it doing for my LLC? Uh, it's building your, your business credit, sure. But you need to build your own personal credit. And how do I get my business credit score? Mm, I don't know, probably through, your, through the bank that you bank with, possibly. Well, I do know, that's not true. Uh, let me answer that question on, on, on the slide in one second about the credit reporting agencies. I do know the answer to that. You just need your EIN for that. Hold that thought. I'll show all of you how to get your credit reports and your credit scores for free, okay? Not through some third party company that's gonna to try to charge you some bogus monthly fee that you don't need to pay. For free, it's by law, but but we'll get there in one second. But is it okay for now to use my business credit card? I mean, is it oh, well, benefiting anything? It's benefiting your business, yeah. But I would like for you to benefit your own personal. Um, why? Because you don't know, are you gonna sell your business tomorrow? You don't know that. Right, but your credit lasts with you for seven years. Okay, your current credit situation follows you for seven years. Why? I'll explain to you in a second. Okay, let me make something clear to you all. Do you like this pretty car? This pretty set of wheels? I think it's pretty sweet. Yeah. BMW big money race. <laughs> I like that big money race. I like it. It's true too. It is true. Um, you know, if you buy a new set of wheels, I told you guys last week, the depreciation, the minute you drive off the lot, right? But anyway, look at how much your credit score, Karina, right there, <laughs> someone else, someone else, someone else, affects the amount of money that you pay to borrow money. Look at this. This is the same $25,000 loan although I think you need a lot more than $25,000 for this vehicle. But take a look. Somebody with the best credit score is gonna get a loan for an automobile at 3% and pay so much less a month than somebody at the worst credit score. Why? Why would banks charge somebody with the worst credit score, I mean, five times? They don't trust them. Trust, did you say? <laughs> You're right, That's, that, that is the crux of it because this borrower represents far bigger risk. So the bank, the lender, whoever it is, the credit card company, the auto lender, the mortgage lender, wants to recuperate as much money off of this loan as fast as possible, right? Because this person is more uh, able to what? Mess it up. Default. Yeah. 
right? They're more liable to default on this loan, okay? So don't we wanna build our credit so that we can borrow money at the lowest rate possible? Of course. We won't have to do this so much. How many of you guys wanna buy a house one day? And by house, I mean any version of a dwelling, whatever it is, a condo, an apartment, a house. Yeah. Don't you wanna be able to borrow money to do that at the lowest possible rate? So what if the, um, so I got offered to refinance. Yeah. So, but I hadn't had the loan for that long. So and look, it was through, not my bank, it was through an auto loan. A refinance is always worth it if the total cost of that process actually saves you money. And you have to really calculate that up front because while the rate might go down, the, re the, the new bank might charge you points, they may charge you extra fees, and sometimes on paper, it looks good until you actually crunch the numbers and the refinance is not only worth the headache or the hassle. So you have to make sense that literally comparing apples to apples, what is the total cost of the refinance? And is it bringing my, not just my payments down, but is it bringing the complete balance that I owe down? Okay, you'd have to really look at the numbers. Even if, it's, even if you have a relationship with that bank, you think they would go out their way to? Banks are here to make profit, right? Unless you're a nonprofit bank. So, bank is always going to make money. They're always going to make money off of. They have to make money off of lending money because they're paying you and me savers to, to save money. So they have to make. Money. What about refinancing to a nonprofit? Uh, if you qualify for one, you're generally always going to get a better rate out of credit union. Yeah. Okay. Let me change the subject for a second because maybe you're sitting here saying, you know what? I don't really care about borrowing money. I'm not going to borrow money for a car. I'm not going to borrow money for a house. I'm not going to borrow money to start a business. Well, here's the other thing. So many companies, if I were tall enough, I'd circle it. I think I am tall enough. I'm not tall enough. So many companies use as part of the screening process, your credit score, your credit report to determine whether you are a reliable, trustworthy candidate, especially if you're going to touch their money. Because if you're gonna to touch their money, they wanna know how responsible are you touching your own money. And so they use your credit report as a piece of the screening process. So you really have to protect your credit. Okay, here's the next piece of free advice I wanna give you. Do not go through any third party to check your credit. Are you hearing me? Credit Karma and freecreditreport.com and all these companies, they are all out to make money that is not necessary. I don't even care if you've been the victim of fraud before. You don't need to be paying, by law I'm telling you, you don't need to be paying anybody to access your credit. Here's how you do it, it's so simple. Go to these three companies' websites, okay? These are the credit reporting agencies. TransUnion, Equifax, Experian. Make this homework for yourself over the break, right? The break is coming, it's, what is it, five weeks away? This is good homework for yourselves over the break when you have some time to think about it, okay? And you know what, shame on me, it has been more than a year since I've done this myself, I'm gonna make this homework for myself too, all right? You go to their websites, TransUnion and Prex Experience. They're gonna ask you some questions that is going to creep you out, okay? Let me give you some examples, you done it? Um, have you ever lived at this address? Yeah. <laughs> Are you related to this person? Yeah. Oh, shit. Yeah. Right? And then they'll ask you some bogus questions that the answer is obviously no, okay? But they're, they know everything about you because Big Brother's watching, all right? And then you get your reports from them. What are you looking for? And by the way, sometimes they give you the score, sometimes they don't. Don't be disappointed if you don't get the score. The score is really not, is not what it, what's important, although I know you want to know your score. But what are you looking for when you get these reports? Accounts are valid, like if they're... Yes. If the debt on these reports is truly your debt, okay? Let me tell you something. Your social security number can be a digit away from somebody else's social security number. You may share the same name as somebody else. Who knows? Or someone has stolen your social security number, okay? But at the end of the day, any... Uh, irregularities, any errors on these reports, by law, you report it, they have to research it and fix it. Sometimes it takes long, sometimes it's simple. Um, my dad, speaking of Saks Fifth Avenue, my dad had a Saks Fifth Avenue account. It was actually on one of my credit reports. We had the same name. 
okay? I got it quickly removed, to get that shit right off my paper, all right, uh, from my report, okay? You have to do this, um, you know, you can do it every year. By law for free. Do not go through a third party. These are the three credit reporting agencies. Well, the child child. Go ahead. I think you can send them your information. You, oh, and actually I just went through, I went through that. You can go to their website and find out if you have been a victim of potential theft of your personal information. It'll tell you yeah. automatically? It will. Through your, you give the last four of your social security and your name, and they'll tell you if they, you know, they were breached and if you were on the breached list. Um, they'll offer you two things. They'll offer you $125 cash or, and I'm telling you, don't take the money, six years of credit reporting, of credit protection. Um, take that because if anything happens and you need to fight it with them, if you take the $125, you, you, you're waiving the right to do that. So don't take the fast cash, take the... Why don't they need to compare though? Why would they do the one? Because of those <laughs> to absolve themselves of legal response, because a lot of dumb people are going to take the one twenty five. Is it what three hundred twenty five bucks? That's great. And in the long term, it's going to cost you a lot more than one hundred twenty five dollars yeah. to dispute huh. an issue on your credit. Take the six years of free whatever it is monitoring. And so, will they tell you if you're um, so to get on a free credit uh, score? Yes. You get on any of these websites. Get on all of them. Oh, okay. All three are different companies, and the data you will see will be slightly different. It could be completely different. And will they, Do tell, all will of they them. make you aware if you already did it? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think most of them probably, because of the law, will only allow you to do it once a year. Um, so they won't log you in, basically? Uh, they won't generate the report for you. You can always log in. I think you just can't. Maybe you and can if they don't it. generate it, then where do you get it from? They have to do it through a third party. No, it's just that you've done it already. Wait until you can do it again. Just do it on your birthday. That's an easy date to always remember, or like January first or something like that. Just pick a day that you're always gonna. That's good advice. Check your credit. That's good advice. I do my, I do my birthday. Work. Let me. That's very good advice. It's actually very good practice to yeah. do that. I, I shame on me. I have not done this in a while, maybe a couple years. Okay. I want to throw out there a common misperception, a wives' tale. Checking your credit hurts your score. You heard this? Yeah. Yeah? Have you heard this? No. Never heard of it? Of myself? Uh, anyone, I know of like, anyone. oh. Checking the credit hurts the score. I heard that. Can you point to me where credit check is part of the mathematical formula? Can you point to, come up here and point if you can. No? Okay. <laughs> You're looking, like, let me look. Nowhere, nowhere. Let me explain to you where that frame of mind comes from, okay? Let's say you're gonna apply for a mortgage, okay? You're gonna buy a home. And you go to 10 banks, and you apply for a mortgage at 10 banks. People do this, all right? Because they don't know if they're gonna, you know, who's gonna have a better rate? Am I gonna get approved? Okay, well, here's the deal. You go to apply at bank number 10. Bank number 10 looks at your credit through these three companies. And what does bank number 10 see? That nine other banks are looking at your credit. What does bank 10 and nine and eight and seven not know? They don't know if you're gonna get one loan or 10 loans. So having lots of pings against your credit can actually be a bad thing. That's what I thought you were asking. Yeah, was like, it doesn't yeah, drive the score down, but it can hurt you in the moment of getting some important loan or thing that you're doing, okay? But you guys, you can check your credit, you can apply for a credit card, you can do what you need to do with your credit when you're doing something really important like Maribel, don't go apply for 15 credit cards, okay? A, because I don't want you to have 15 credit cards, and B, because I don't want 14 other lenders to see, or one lender to see 15 pings against your credit, okay? That's all it is, all right? And then by the way, I wanna say it one more time, once you get that new credit, once you get that new line of credit extended to you, what happens to your score? It drops. It drops, it does. It goes down very temporarily, but anytime you have new credit that you haven't, proven a track record on, your score does go down slightly. It goes infinitely up once you start paying the bill. All right, question, Karina. Um, so what's the best credit card to get? Uh, Through your bank or just in the... Honestly, 
I, I'm going to be honest with you, for, and I don't know your individual situations, okay? So I don't know, do you travel a lot? Do you this a lot? Do you that a lot? Do you use a lot of gas? Um, for right now, I'll make the safest statement. Any credit card that's free, so that has no annual fee, I think is great. And credit cards that offer cash back, to me, is the most useful. Oh, man, it's okay? so lovely. It's great. It's great. I have a Chase cashback card. Um, I, I, I don't use it much, but I mean, it's 1% cashback for everything you purchase. So for every $100 I spend, I get a dollar back. It adds up, okay? To me, that's a great deal. Now, it's a much more complicated answer. It depends on a lot of stuff and what your credit score is and all this kind of stuff. But for all of you right now, any credit card that's free, that gives you some kind of perk back is much better than using cash. And it's much, much better than using a debit card. Okay? Okay. Um, you don't have to answer the next question, but you can if you want to. How many of you have ever got uh, applied for a credit card and been declined? A long time ago, okay. and I didn't have credit. Cool. I appreciate the honesty. And for the rest of you, no, whatever. Okay, fine. So, when you're applying for a credit card, you are applying for an unsecured debt credit card, all right? That simply means that you're not using collateral, you're just stating what your social security number is, and you're hopefully telling the truth about your income, and that's kind of it, right? And it's kind of a like, we're gonna give you a little bit until you prove that you can handle a lot. If you cannot get approved, Maribel, you can't get approved for whatever reason, and I have a feeling you will, you can apply for what's called a secured debt credit card. Every single one of you can get approved for a secured debt credit card. Let me explain to you what that means. And it doesn't have to be Hello Kitty, although it could be if you like it. A secured debt credit card basically is a debit card. Mr. Compton, you just said you hate debit cards and we shouldn't use them. Yeah, yeah. This is a debit card though that works like a credit card. So it's not attached to your checking account. It doesn't expose you to danger. And it does report to the credit reporting agencies. Name them for me again. Experience, yeah. and the bad one? Equifax, yeah, beautiful. Equifax, Equifax, however you want to say it. Not that they're the bad one, but they're the one, <laughs> you know, that clearly does not have any good IT firewalls, right? So that's all it is. And then guess what happens? Let me tell you the exciting part. Secured debt credit cards become unsecured debt. They actually then become a regular credit card after you've established payment history. Now, I want to tell you the one and only bad story I have about my hero, Susie Norman. It was the one, the one piece of drama she has had in her squeaky clean story. And that's that she endorsed um, a secure debt credit card. It was the Susie Orman, the approved card from Susie Orman. And the media thought that was really shady because secured debt credit cards generally are for people who, you know, are more economically disadvantaged and people really didn't like the fact that she, you know, was making buck off of, you know, people who weren't, you know, wealthier. So she got some nasty press about it and stuff like that. But anyway, I had to tell you that's the one, the one bad thing about my hero there. Okay, um, we talked about these two things, we talked about paying on time, and we talked about do not cancel credit cards. Are you with me? Yes? Yes. Use them, pay them, buy a sandwich on it, $5. Let that bill come, pay the five bucks, do it every month, okay? I'm not telling you you have to buy things that you wouldn't otherwise be buying. Just use the credit card for stuff you'd otherwise be using the debit card or cash to buy. Pay it, keep your credit cards current. Okay, Oof. that was all step one. <laughs> okay, what was step one? Manage your credit, beautiful, that's it. Manage it like it's a job, once a year. Okay, like Eric said, choose, make it your birthday. Make it a gift to yourself by correcting your credit. I like it, all right? Bridget, I have a question. Please. Is it okay to like monitor your credit card? Yeah, yeah, of course it is. I just don't think it's worth the money. No, I mean, but it's, I like, I don't pay for credit cards. Is it's it like free? To, mm -hmm. Then yes. I mean, to monitor, I don't like. I don't try to get my report off of it. Like uh -huh. I've got them off of the. Yep. You know, yep. But so many of those reports. services charge. I've seen seven ninety five. I've seen fourteen ninety five. Okay. For what? It's they're doing the same thing that you're gonna be doing once a year, 
And those companies, by law, have to amend and fix and research mistakes that they make, fraud that exists. So to me, it's like if you, if you do it once a year, why do you need a third party monitoring anything? That's just my, yeah. that's my opinion. And only because of working on it. And mine is more from medical bills. I couldn't pay the hospital sure. all this money at one time, yep. you know, but yep. um, in working on it and seeing it go up, yeah. So I'm monitoring the, my score, yep. not necessarily, I'm not getting my report, yep. you know, from it. By the way, there are many banks and credit card companies that will give you your score for free in their apps, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all mm -hmm. the time. My American Express card gives me my score. I can log in and look at it anytime. time. Yeah, good question. Okay, step two. Step two is setting up your emergency fund, okay? Or as she calls it in her book, your rainy day fund. What happens on a rainy day on planet Earth, living this life we call life? What can happen? You have a cash flow and stuff. Why? Because you might get laid off or get in an accident. Great. Or Lose your job. A person might be hospitalized. Hospitalization, health issues, death. Death of a loved one, death of a parent, um, you know, diagnoses, you get the C word, the this word, the that word, you just don't know, okay? Divorce, sure, just major changes in your financial situation. Um, say it again? Sure, all of those things, right? It can impact your job, lose your house, who knows what, okay? Who, the point is, who knows what? So, you will walk around on planet Earth a more confident person if you know that you have this rainy day fund set up. Okay, all this is, and by the way, don't write this number down because I'm gonna show you something in a second, but all this is is a savings account. I am not talking about anything fancy right now, yet. This is just a savings account, okay? In an FDIC insured bank account. Do you all have a bank account? Everybody have a bank account here? Yes, if you don't, you're lying to me, you need to go get yourself a bank account, okay? Because wealthy people do not pay other people to access their money. If every time you make a paycheck, you have to go to Walmart to cash it, and they're charging you three, four, five percent, that's ridiculous. You can't even make three percent in a savings account right now, but you're paying Walmart three percent to cash your check. No, no. You need a free checking and savings account, okay? You need free access to your money. Anyway, that is where this account is. Now, it's for this stuff, layout, publishes. Susie used to say six months, now don't screw this up on quiz on exam, of living expenses. Not six months salary, six months living expenses. Okay, first, she's amended it. Now, one year, 12 months, write it down, 12 months. Living expenses, not salary. What's the difference? What's the, the difference? The expenses is what you're paying your overhead. Yep, what you're paying to live, your overhead, another way of putting it, yeah. And salary is what? What you earn. Right, it's all the money that you're making. Hopefully you're making more than what your overhead is. Now, also six month living expenses is the bare bones minimum because if you do lose your job, if you do have a death, if you do lose your house, you're not, going out to the movies, you're not buying new clothes, you're not, you know, drinking wine. With me on this one, right? So, here's the quick exercise I want to do, okay? Let's go. I want you to think about what it costs you to live. Some of you have maybe done this already, you have it in Excel spreadsheet, at home, you know what your budget is. What does it cost you to live in a month? What are your bills in a month? Don't, don't include for me, um, go ahead, take a don't include for me things like, you know, going out to the movies and entertainment. And what is the bare bones minimum? This is a typical American household right here. Take a look. A third of the typical American household spends their money on housing, whether that be rent or mortgage or whatever the hell it is, all right? Um, take a look, 12% on food. I like this one. 0.9% of alcoholic beverages, more at the Conti household. <laughs> I tell you that. More for sure, here as well. Um, you know, healthcare, so 
make yourself, we don't have enough time to really do this exercise properly, but just go through what are the fixed expenses you have? Do you pay rent? How much is that rent? Do you pay a car payment? How much is that car payment? Do you pay insurance? Do you pay electricity? Do you have a cell phone bill? Because you need, you're not gonna turn your cell phone off, obviously. You need that to look for a job, right? What else? Um, internet. You need that. What are your bills? Jot these down for me quick. I just, I wanna get a sense of where people of your age in 2019 are. What else you got? Food. And I'm not, you know, high end restaurant food. This isn't the latest. You know, Mexican joint. This is like, you know, I don't know if you get a cheap supermarket. I'm not the only one. Cheap supermarket. <laughs> All right. What else you got? Health insurance. You know, got to go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, you yeah. still have to get to interview, job interviews, or okay. take the sick loved one to the hospital. All right. So Submission. If you're in this situation, I might tell you it's time for an educational break. Okay. Kind of, maybe. Okay. Maybe. If you're in what situation? Mm -hmm. The rainy day situation. Oh. The rainy day situation. What I don't want you to include in this number is stuff that has to stop because of the rainy day situation. Okay? So we're not buying clothes. We're not vacationing. Are you with me? This is just like the bare bones minimum. What does it cost you to live on planet Earth? Okay, so from my experience doing this every trimester, um, uh, you guys at your age bracket, I was here around like 1,500 the low end. Tell me if I'm way off. <laughs> for a month, for a month, for, for one month, for one month. Wish. With all of that? Yeah. Oh. Way more than that? Yes. Yeah? It's expensive to live on this planet, is it not? <laughs> yeah? How much? 2,000? Yeah, right. 3,200? Is that between you and your wife? Okay. She's passed away, God forbid. How does that impact the cost of you living? It goes down somewhat. Well, I hate to have these there, like there's a, there's a new dark, terrible conversations, but we have to have them. Well, there would be a new thing on there. <laughs> quite substantial. There you go. And then that's I mean, no. Mine's like, <laughs> but look, I mean, the good news is the insurance bill goes in. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Harp will talk about it. We really have to think about this stuff, though, right? We have to think about it, okay? So throw it out there. What, what are, what's your, so 33,000? 55. That much. A month. Okay? Mine's about that. And I just kept up my paper. All right, let, let me just use an easy round number, okay? $2,000 a month, all right? Times 12 equals $24,000 a month. So here's the point I wanna make, all right? That is your goal for cold, hard cash in a savings account. And it ain't gonna happen in a year or two years. It's gonna take years, okay, to amass this amount. And then by the way, as your quality of life goes up, because it will, right? Your cost of living is gonna go up, yes? And so therefore, your rainy day fund, the amount of cash that you have in the bank, has to go up. It has to go up proportionate to how much it costs you to live on planet Earth. So I want you to keep that in the back of your head. Now, I'm gonna move on. I'm gonna move on, but I need to tell you, this has to be established before everything that we talk about next, except, except this. And I'll explain to you why. So you have to have your rainy day fund maxed out to the max mm -hmm. before you do anything else financially, except step three, your second investment. Okay? So let's talk about these and I'll explain to you what I mean. So step three of the six step plan which is your second investment, your first investment is the rainy day fund, is retirement. Now again, Mr. Coffey, I'm 19 years old. You're gonna to talk to me about retirement? Yes, I am. Because I want you to benefit from the information that I did not have and was too embarrassed to ask, okay? How many of you know what a 401k is? Hands. Two. 
Okay. Okay. A 401k, quiz question tonight, I think, is a pension fund. What is a pension? Well, pension is just a fancy word for retirement, okay? And let me explain to you something. Once upon a time, you and I went to go work for one company, we worked for them for 30 years, and then upon retirement, that company would pay out to us a portion of our salary for the rest of our lives until we died. How many of you are gonna go work for a company for 30 years? No one figured that, figured <laughs> we don't do that anymore, okay? So instead of companies giving us retirement accounts, we have to give them to ourselves. Okay, so that's what a 401k is. It's a pension fund. It is transportable. So let me explain to you what that means. When you get to the first company that pays you a 401k, okay, the 401k is an account that is in a third party investment brokerage. It could be Fidelity, it could be Vanguard, it could be Schwab, it could be who else? Where do you guys have your 401ks? Fidelity, you said you have 401k? No, nope. do you have a 401k? No, okay, anybody has a 401k in the room? It's, uh, it's, it's through uh, What is that? Department of Defense, okay. So it's like a treasury, it's a, it's a US like treasury. And let me be completely honest, like I don't know my past couple of jobs, I've been having full time, they have it through a 401k. Does that mean I have one? Or? Probably, okay. yeah. So I guess. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I now. literally, I have no idea what I'm like, every time. I wish somebody could show them like what it all is, but I'm just like, Jenny, okay, good. I, I, I'm telling you right now, I was there. I did exactly what you did. Fill out the book. It's really scary. You turn it in. Like, I hope that's right. I have no idea what I'm signing up for, right? right? <laughs> so you probably do have 401ks that you may not even be aware that the accounts are out there, but there's money in them because the money came out of your paycheck. So let me explain to you, okay? And we'll get to the bottom of where that money is and what those accounts are. So first of all, it's transportable. Does everybody understand that he's set up in a third-party bank, okay? Not a depository bank, a non-depository bank, like a Fidelity, a Charles Schwab, whatever the case is. Okay, that account is yours. It's not the company's. It's not the company you work with, it's yours, okay? When you quit that job, like Jenny did, like I did, okay? That account, that money transfers with you, it transports, okay? When you get to company number two, that offers a 401k. If they offer a 401k with the same financial provider, it's still fidelity, you keep going. You have a new account in that same company, you keep going, you contribute. If they don't use that same one, it's a different one, it's now it's Vanguard, it's really simple. Fidelity will cut you a check, okay? It's called rolling it over, and you roll the money over from the first account into your new account with your new company's 401k. Okay, so that's, that's the first thing I need you to know. It's a pension fund, okay? It's employer-sponsored. It's transportable from one company to another. Two reasons why I want you to do a 401k, even if your rainy day fund, even if it ain't started, okay? Or even if you don't have enough money in it. The first thing is never, this is only the second time I'm saying never, what was my first never? Never. never. Beautiful, beautiful. Here's my second. Never, 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 never say no to free money. Do not say no to free money. Your employer is going to match the money that you put into this account. Sometimes dollar for dollar up to a max. You gonna say no to that? Can we gossip for a second? Do you know how many Wade College employees that we have a 401k? Don't do it. Wade College matches, not a whole lot, but something. And you have employees basically saying, no thank you to the free money. Blows my mind. If I came in here with a hundred bucks and I said, here, take it. You gonna say no thanks? Yeah, yes. I'll tell you why it's free money too, if you wanna really know. Because when you take money from your paycheck and put it into this 401k, you are doing it pre-tax. So you're driving your taxable income down. Do you understand that? If your paycheck's $100 and you're gonna put $10 of it into the 401k, 
now your taxable income is only $90. You only have to pay tax on $90. The full 10 goes into this account. You get to cheat Uncle Sam for now. Yeah. For now. That's great. But let me tell you, the employer is going to also put $10 in the account. You know why? A, because it's a perk of working for your company, but also you have just made their payroll tax go down. So they're paying less on you. You're paying less on you and they're paying less on you. It's a win-win. And now you have just saved double. Get it? Okay. So there's an employer match and it is pre-tax investing. When do you pay the tax on this money? No. When do you pay tax on this money? Every paycheck. No, that's the beauty of it. Whatever money you take out to put into your 401k, and by the way, right now, 2019, you can put up to $18,000 a year. So you can take out of your paycheck a max of $18,000 a year pre-tax. You take that whole amount of money out of your paycheck for the year, you don't pay tax on it. And then you wind up paying tax on a lot less money. It's a win-win, but when do you pay the tax? When you do your tax When do you withdraw? Oh yeah. Just like when you go to the bank, when you withdraw. Right now, you have to be 59 and a half to start withdrawing from this account, okay? That's honestly pretty young. If you think about it, it's true retirement age isn't really until 60s. But you can begin withdrawing from these accounts at 59 and a half, and no, I will not answer questions about withdrawing early. Don't even pretend that's not an option. Okay? It is the dumbest thing to take a loan against your 401k. It, it has so many penalties, it's the worst thing you can do with your money. Do not take loans against your 401k account. Okay. You don't touch the money until you're 59 now. Okay, now let's Even talk for a second. Laid off and you don't have I don't care. Easy. Eat cat food. Don't touch <laughs> your 401k. I mean, it's in the past now, it was 2008 when the economy was bad and I lost my job. Okay. So, and I, I forgot that. I mean, it was. That was a bad time. Look, so most people don't know. <laughs> most people don't yeah. know what the financial ramifications yeah, it was, are. Yeah. It's bad. But it, it was, that was the last of the last of the last. Yeah, but look yeah. where you are now, right? Yes. Never look back. Yep. You're doing great. But um, <laughs> the deal is, is that uh, they really incentivize you to keep the money in there, okay? Yeah. Because it's, you're, you're providing for your own retirement. Okay, one more thing. One more thing that I want to explain to you here. Think about you at the top of your career. Think about you when you're making a six-figure salary, okay? How much tax are you paying when you make a six-figure salary? You're in a high rack, okay? So when you make that kind of money when you're at the top of your career, you're in a very high tax bracket. You have to 39% tax. But when you are retired, generally speaking, and you're not making a traditional income, what kind of tax bracket are you in? Lower, depends. Some of us the lowest, some of us lower. Depends on what other income we have coming in, okay? So when do you wanna pay tax on this money? When you're at the height of your career making lots of moolah, or when you're in retirement in a lower tax bracket? When you're high in, well, when you're lower, lower tax. When you're lower. You wanna pay the money when your tax bracket's the lowest, because you're gonna pay a lot less oh, yeah. taxes, right? That's the beauty of a traditional 401k. It enables you to defer your taxes. Do you get it? It enables you to take $18,000 out of your paycheck, not in the one paycheck over the year, okay? Not pay tax on that money, and then not pay the tax until you're in a lower tax bracket in retirement. Ta-da! Okay, but even if you don't care about any of that stuff, care about free money. What did I say? Never say no to? <laughs> I never said that. <laughs> Who's your professor after this? You, that's it. Oh, you got me twice. Bless, bless your heart. <laughs> uh, and so do you. No, you don't. You, no, have, no, no. you have me twice. Bless your heart. Do you guys have another class after this? I 
Uh, nobody? Who do you have? Oh, you don't even know. Yes. Comer? <laughs> Ask <laughs> Comer. <laughs> Ask Comer. Are you saying no to free money? Oh, oh my God. God. Ask him. <laughs> Ask him. How many of you have Renaga? Go ask Renaga. Are you saying no to free money? Your employer gives you free money. Are you saying no? Ask them. Is he saying no? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Now. How many of you have never worked for a company that has offered a 401k or you, do, you didn't qualify for it, maybe you weren't full time, maybe the 401k was only for full time employees? Raise your hand. Most of you, right? Okay. This is the same damn thing for the most part. IRA, individual retirement account. Quiz question, multiple choice question. It's the same thing, it's tax deferred pension fund, same thing, all right? It's a pension fund retirement account, tax deferred. You get to put money into an IRA. Do you pay tax on it? No, you don't pay tax on it until you withdraw, all right? The only difference is there's no this, because there's no employer. An IRA, you guys could set up at your bank. You go to your bank, you set this up at your bank, it's your account, you can put money into it pre-tax. You can have your employer direct deposit into it. You don't pay tax on it. The money sits in gross, okay? The only crappy difference is that there's no dollar for the dollar match or 50 cents on the dollar. Employers vary, all right? With the IRA, it is you. It is your own individual account. Is it still 59 and a half? Yes. So what if, like, say, like, I'm in an IRA and then all of a sudden, like, Good question. Can you do both? The answer is yes. Okay. You can do both and you can contribute to both in the same year. It is 18,000 for 401k and I believe this year, no, it went up to 13,000 for IRA. Okay. So yes, you can do $31,000 if you can afford that, knock yourself out. So you can put $31,000. We do the IRA, you can just go and put money towards it whenever you have like loose money to go. Uh, you can, yes. So if you're self-employed, you can direct deposit into the account. If you have an employer, the employer can direct deposit on a regular basis straight into the account. Yeah, depends so on how you set just up take like a monthly? It depends on how often you get paid. You get paid weekly, it's a direct deposit weekly. You get paid twice a month, direct deposit twice a month. And so which one, I mean, uh, what's the benefits of the IRA besides the retirement? Tax deferred. It's tax deferred. You're avoiding paying tax now, so it's a shelter for your money, all right? And then you pay tax later when you are in a lower tax bracket. It's the same as the world. Yeah, it's like a fancy savings account for your pre-tax money. And you do that through a bank or through a company? Through a bank. Okay. okay, has everybody heard about Roth? Roth IRA, and there are even Roth 401ks. Have you heard of this term, Roth? I've heard of it. You heard of it? Yeah. How many of you have heard of it? Do you have to qualify for the IRA? No. No. How many of you heard of Roth? Okay. Here's the difference. It's really simple. Okay. Roth simply means that you are going to pay tax on the money upfront. Upfront. Okay. So let me tell you guys, young people, I'm assuming you all are young or you had good work done. All right, but you young people, you're in low tax brackets now. Maybe you're not making a lot of money right now, right? You'd be better off right now paying tax on the money now, putting it in a Roth IRA or Roth 401k, and then that money, it's gonna accrue interest over years and years and years. If that money's free and clear, you've already paid the tax on it. You don't pay tax on it in retirement. So that money is 100% yours. considered worse. retired though? Uh, 59 and a half or whenever you, want to withdraw the money thereafter. You can keep the money. Actually, these accounts do require you to take distributions. You can't just leave the money in there until you die. You have to take money out, but you can't start until 59 and a half. And then the, uh, the how much tax do you pay? Up until your- Whatever your current rate is. Up in, uh, their rate, right? Your rate. Your personal rate, depending on what tax bracket you belong to. And that has to do with how much money you make salary, from your investments, from a whole bunch of different financial So businesses. how long do you have, when does that tax expire? Like when do you stop paying taxes on? Mm, you, don't, you never stop, you just pay it. So 
when you invest money in a Roth IRA, you're investing with money that you have already paid tax on. Here's an example. I work at Wade College. Yeah, I get my paycheck. I've already paid tax on that money. Yeah. So if I want to put $500 in my Roth IRA, I've already paid tax on that money. When I'm 59 and a half or 60 or 70 or 80 and I want to take that $500 out, which is now probably 5,000, yeah, I've already paid tax on that Roth account. It is tax free. But what if you don't work for Wade and you wait to work for yourself and then you go in there and you tax it? Well, is it Roth or is it not, or is it traditional? If it's Roth, I've already paid money tax on it. If it's traditional, I have not paid tax on it. I'm going to pay tax when I withdraw in my retirement. And you can do both. You can do both. People hedge their bets because they're not 100% sure where they're going to be 50 years from now in, in tax situation, right? So they do both. They invest in both, traditional and Roth. You can change it? No. When an account is set up, you only, it remains that way. And you can only put that kind of money in it, okay? A traditional account gets pre-tax money. A Roth IRA is already paid for money. But if you say you blow up and make it bigger than that, the Roth is going to tax you more because you're in a higher uh, tax bracket. If you push yourself into a higher tax, you get a big promotion, you make more money, then you just stop doing your Roth IRA. Just stop contributing to it. Just like your savings account. I if I don't have money this month to put in a savings account, I just don't have money in my savings account. Just let it grow? Correct. Oh. Yes. And you just let it improve. Can you have one of each? Yes, oh. you can have four. Oh. You can do them all. You can do them all. Okay. So let's review as we go on, all right? Step one in the six step road to wealth is manage your credit. credit. You better believe it, right? Making good decisions. Give me some examples of good decisions about your credit. Paying it on time. <laughs> That's it. Pay it on time, <laughs> pay it in full. Don't buy shit you can't afford, right? Check that credit score once a year. Check the report once a year. How many reports do you have? Three. 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 Beautiful. Okay, step two create a Emergency fund. Yeah, rainy day fund, emergency fund, savings account, whatever the hell you want to call it. How much money do you need in there? 12 months salary? 12 months living expenses. 12 months living expenses, perfect. Yes, living expenses. Bare bones overhead, okay? Whatever that is. As the cost of living goes up, the amount of money you need in that account goes up. Okay, third step. Invest in your what? Retirement. Retirement, you got it. Either 401k, IRA, or both if you can can afford to, all right? Um, if my rainy day fund is small, if my rainy day fund does not cover an emergency, can I invest in retirement? Yes. Why? Um, because you never, 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 never turn away free money. say no to free money, right? So I don't, okay. My question was, if I don't have enough money in my rainy day account, if I cannot cover an emergency, should I, can I invest in retirement? And the answer is, hell yeah, you better. Because we never say no to free money, you right? Can invest in the 401k. 401k, you got it. When an employer is offering you a match on your money, I don't care what your financial situation is, you do it. You contribute to the extent of whatever the match is, okay? Because you don't want to say no to free money. Okay, step four. So this is the third investment, but it's the fourth step, okay? This is the step you don't want to touch until, and I wanna make this really clear to everybody, you now have a maxed out rainy day fund that reflects your cost of living, cool? And you're doing appropriate retirement savings, hopefully to the max, whatever that is. It's gonna change, every year it goes up a little bit. Okay, right now you want to do a 401k, you're putting $18,000 a year out of your paycheck into it, okay? Then you still have leftover money. You'll get there, I promise. I remember the day that that happened for me. I'm like, what? My bills are paid, I've invested in retirement, and there's money left over? What is this strange thing, okay? <laughs> now what? And I'm not saying, you're, you're, you're doing your thing, you're traveling, you're buying the stuff that you want, but there's money left over, okay? It is the best. It's the point of being successful, right? Now we need to think about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and real estate. Okay? Kind of the last four things I want to talk about. Let's talk about stocks. 
So, the stock market. Now, by the way, what you may not realize is that your 401k and your IRA, that money that's sitting in that Fidelity account or that Vanguard account or that whatever account, it's probably sitting in some type of stock and bond investment. So we need to understand stocks and bonds in order to understand what these retirement accounts are doing. Because they're not just sitting in like a little savings account making you 2%. Because 2% is not gonna get you to retirement. I mean, you'll get to retirement, but you're not gonna have a cheap retirement. We want a cute retirement, yeah? So, stocks. When you're buying a stock, you're buying equity. What is equity? You're buying equity. Give me another word for equity. Value. Value, exactly, that's right. Car has equity, a home has equity, you know, a watch that you buy has equity, and so do companies. When you're buying a stock, you're buying a company's equity, you're buying a piece of its value, a share of its value, okay? What do you hope to happen to that company's value? Duh, <laughs> go up, right? You hope for it to go up. You hope for the value of that company shares to go up, okay? In the meantime, you become part owner of the company. You all understand that from last week's lecture, all right? Now, when you hold on to a stock for a period of time, it's gotta be longer than three months, if the company makes a profit, if the company declares a profit, they may share that profit with you. I wanted to show you my dividends, but I'm using my phone right now. Otherwise, I would I usually show the cost of my dividends. Um, dividends, are a company taking its profits for the quarter and dividing them up onto the shareholders, okay? So if you have 10 shares of Facebook and Facebook is declaring a dollar a share dividend, you're gonna make 10 bucks, okay? That is your piece of the company's profit. And this is why people hold stocks for long, 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 long periods of time because stocks pay dividends, all right? It's like, it's like interest. Okay, that's not the value of the shares increasing. That's the company issuing dividends, okay? But then also hopefully the value of your shares are increasing because eventually what do you wanna do with these shares that you hold? Sell them at a profit. Let me give you an example. A few years ago, I bought Under Armour. You guys know Under Armour? So they're pretty much like Nike's, you know, kind of competition, although the company has had a really hard time, okay? And they've done a whole lot of things. They hired um, Steph Curry as a spokesperson. They did a whole bunch of things. So really innovative design, they have good product, they hire new people. I actually know a lot of people that work for their corporation because I used to work for them at another company, Vanity Fair. I used to work with them. I bought shares of this company, Under Armour, for about $17 a share, okay? And the company's value at one point for a brief period of time spiked up to $44 a share. Think about that for a second. I bought for $17 a share, and the company spiked up to $44 a share. Do the math for me. to make that amount of money. Now, I didn't sell my shares because I'm holding on to them because I believe the company is going to do better than that. 
Okay, I believe that they're gonna. I don't know. I have my I have my theory. Okay? So I'm holding on to the chairs and stuff. Designers come in. Yeah, all that kind of stuff. And maybe do something that Nike fails to do. Or maybe have some kind of technology that Nike misses out on for a season, and boom, I have my my moment of opportunity. Okay, but I'm just giving you a sense. But in the meantime, let me just share with you. I make a nice little dividend from this company Under Armour four times a year, every quarter, March, July, uh, no, March, June, September, and December. And I'm happy with that. And the value of my shares of stock continue to go up. Okay? That's the stock market game. Now, back to our conversation earlier, you can get a stockbroker to advise you on this stuff. I don't think that you need that. If you want to buy shares of stock, you can go through what's called a discount brokerage. E-Trade, you heard of E-Trade.com? It's a discount brokerage. You set up an account, you link it to your checking account, you can buy and sell shares of stock, and you know, and the, the trades are only like $5 a trade. So it doesn't cost a whole lot, okay? Um, but I have a better solution for you than this. But I want you to just understand what, what stocks are. Okay, bonds are the opposite concept. So what do we say when we buy a stock? What are we buying? Equity. Equity, which is value. When we buy a bond, we are buying the opposite. What's the opposite of value? What's the opposite of worth? Debt. Okay? Why the hell would we want to buy debt? Well, there's value in debt. You didn't pay interest. You got it. That's right. Because it pays interest. Okay? Who's debt? Would you all buy? Okay. Uh, sure, corp corporate corporations. Yeah, corporations have debt. Why would American Airlines take on debt? That's an easy question. For acquisition. Yeah, maybe. Or how about an easier one? Buy planes. What if American Airlines wants to buy a hundred new planes tomorrow? You think they have the cash to do that? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But they can issue corporate bonds. They can say, listen, we're taking on $100 million of debt to buy new planes. We're gonna issue corporate bonds. Any one of you could buy corporate bonds, okay? You could also buy treasury bonds, municipal bonds, war bonds. What's okay. treasury? I'll tell you. I'll, I'll tell you treasury, municipal, and war in, one, in a nutshell. Those are you, the borrower, or really the lender, Lending money to either the federal government, that's a treasury bond, a city or state, that's a municipal bond, um, or the Department of Defense, that's a war bond. That you can buy a war bond to help finance war, if that's your bag. Where do you buy bonds? And don't you have to have an attorney or something? Not at all. Not at all. So, um, with treasury bonds, you can literally go onto their website, ustreasury. I don't know. Gulp, I guess, and you can buy treasury bonds through the website. Um, your commercial bank that you bank at, you can buy bonds there. For corporate bonds, it's similar to buying stocks. However, I have a better solution for you than buying individual bonds or buying individual stocks. It's an easier situation that you don't need a third party to explain a lot to you, okay? But before we go, you got it, that's the answer. Before we go there, does everybody understand what a bond is? Read this little passage for a second. Have you ever borrowed money from a friend? Read this, it, it, it explains it perfectly. You at home can read it too. <laughs> so where do we find your uh, YouTube? I'll send you a link. So isn't that interesting? Basically, you become the bank. That's what a bond is. You're now the bank. You're the one doing the lending. You're lending your money either to the US Treasury, maybe the state of Texas, the city of Dallas. You know, you could buy Dallas City Municipal Bonds. Why would you wanna buy Dallas City Municipal Bonds? Because Dallas is borrowing money to build a bridge or build a park. Actually, we are building a park. Do you all know that? Yeah. Where? Do you wanna tell us about it? Uh, by the uh, Trinity River, right? So the Trinity River, which is no longer a river, it's just a dirt patch, um, they're building a park that is gonna be 11 times the size 
of Central Park in New York City. Wow. And it's gonna be this beautifully landscaped, unbelievable thing, and it is gonna be designed purposely to flood. So everything in it, the landscaping and the life and everything is gonna be flood, not even flood proof, like it's gonna be flood loving. <laughs> I don't know if that's the term, flood loving. And guess what? A lot of it is gonna be City of Dallas money that is created to build the public work like that. The train. Oh, the, the bullet train from Dallas Houston, that's another thing. That, I think, is a private corporation. I'm not 100% sure of it. That's going to make life pretty sweet, too. But this park is going to be like the bomb.com, right? Um, but why would you want to buy bonds? Because the city of Dallas ain't going anywhere. Yeah, the city of Dallas is not going bankrupt. And the city of Dallas is going to pay you back with interest. And it's a pretty much a safe investment. Agree? Um, I told you guys earlier, Susie Orman is a huge fan of municipal bonds because they pay a higher interest rate than a typical bank, but they're pretty damn safe. The United States is not going out of business. The state of Texas is certainly not going out of business. The city of Dallas is not going out of business. So municipal bonds, federal bonds, treasury bonds, war bonds, they're good investments. Okay? So, like, just like example, like in, um, you put 100? Yep, put 100 in, how much do you make back? So. Um, the bond that your grandma gave you when you were born, that maybe you have in some like box somewhere, that one maybe took 25 years to double in value. So she may have paid 50 bucks for it, and now it's worth $100 a lot of years later, okay? Those were like, I think they were Series E bonds. Um, it depends, some bonds pay 4%, 3%, 5%, it just depends on, um, on who the borrower is. Remember, you're the lender, who the borrower is and just what, what it's being used to fund, okay? So, corporate bonds pay more mm -hmm. because they're a little more risky. What can a corporation do? Shut down. Go bankrupt, right? Yeah. So there's a little bit, anytime they have more risk, you have the better potential for return. The higher the risk, the higher the return. The lower the risk, the lower the return. So can we skip all these steps and just buy a bond? Um, no, and I'll tell you why. Because bonds are not really that liquid. So a lot of times when you lock up money in a bond, you're locking up that money for a period of time. And the problem with that is, what if you lose your house or your job, right? Or you get the big C. Now you have, you have money. What's the big C? That's the floor yeah, I work on the, the hospital. Oh, the floor you work on. That's, <laughs> that's the floor I never want to have to visit, okay? And God bless you for the work you do, Sarah, and I mean that. Um, but you know, we want to have regular cash in the bank in case we hear a big C, or layoff, or my house burned down, okay? Okay, now, this is really my last slide. But if you've taken a nap, come back to me, I miss you. Because this has taken me 20 years to study and learn, and I'm sharing it with you and lucky freaking you people, okay? I wish I had me 20 years ago. What if I told you that you could take the money that you want to invest, okay? And pool that money together with a whole bunch of other investors. And instead of you having to look into a crystal ball to find out Under Armour maybe is gonna make a profit next year, what if I told you you could take your money and sprinkle it across, theoretically, every single stock and bond in the entire stock and bond market? And what if it wasn't just you making the investment? What if it was millions of investors pooling money together? And what if it was billions of dollars being invested? Not just in one stock or one bond, but the entire market. Well, what I'm describing to you is a mutual fund. And it's the last thing I want you to learn tonight, but it's the most important, okay? You guys, the majority of my net worth is invested in mutual funds. I believe in them very strongly, okay? So, a mutual fund is a collection of stock and bond where you're pooling your money with other investors, just to explain that to you, and a professional manager is basically managing this investment on behalf of all of these millions of people. Okay, now, I wanna to explain to you some of this stuff. There are different types of mutual funds. Let's start with my favorite, index funds, okay? Have you ever heard of the S&P 500 or 
the Dow Jones 30. Heard of the Dow? The Dow is up today. The Dow is down today. You heard of the Dow? Okay. What the hell is the Dow? Does anybody know? The Dow is the Dow Jones Industrial Index. Let me explain to you what that is in plain English. It is the top one stock, so the top stock, in each of 30 industries. For example, it's the top tech stock, the top retail stock, the top telecommunication stock, the top food stock, okay? And so the Dow Jones Industrial Index is the top 30 stocks across 30 industries. You can buy one share of the Dow Jones Industrial Index, and that's basically spreading your money across the top 30 stocks and the top 30, top 30 industries. Okay. S&P 500, heard of it? No? I follow the S&P 500 the most closely. I look at it every day. Standard & Poor's 500 index. These, this is a mutual fund, an index fund, of the top 500 stocks on the American, the New York Stock Exchange, the American Stock Exchange, the New York Stock Exchange. Not to begin with the Chicago Stock Exchange. Okay? It's just the top 500 stocks. Okay? Um, what are the top 500 stocks these days? Apple, Google, Facebook, um, Walmart, Disney. Starbucks, maybe Disney. Sure, I'm sure they're in the 500 for sure. Maybe not top 10, but yeah, Coca Cola, right? The top 500. So, why would people want to invest in the SP 500 fund or the Dow Jones 30 fund? Because instead of taking all of your eggs and putting them in one basket, Disney, and then tomorrow Disney has some kind of scandal because who knows what, and then the value of all of your money drops, why not take your money and sprinkle it across 500 stocks? Okay, if that doesn't excite you, let me give you literally the one piece of investing advice you need, period. Still a big one. I'm invested in something called uh, the total stock market index fund. Now my favorite brokerage is Vanguard because they're super, 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 super discount. They charge you the least amount of money. Their management fees for these people are the lowest. So I invested in the Vanguard total stock market index fund. Take a wild guess what that is. It takes investors money and where do you think it sprinkles it across? You got it. It invests in every single stock in the entire stock market. So now my gains and losses track the entire market. What do we know about the stock market? It does. Yep. Oh man, the last week has been a freaking roller coaster. However, the stock market is at an absolute historic high. The S&P 500 is at 3,000, or was at 3,000 last week. It has never been higher. Dow Jones, the same. We have never seen the stock market perform this insanely, ever, ever. Why is it all time? Why? I'm gonna explain it to you in simple terms, because of investor speculation. Because we're under a Republican administration, uh, a lot of like red tape and and there's been a lot of tax shelters for corporations, so corporations are making more money, and so investors are investing more freely in, in, in these stocks, okay? Um, it's been a trend over the last couple of years. What was my question? I forgot. You have words all over your face. You look like a newspaper. Oh, I have one all over my oh, face? because of the, being in a screen. Oh, gotcha. That's been literally like I'm black marker. Uh, oh, Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. It takes your money and invests it across every single stock. Oh, here's my question. My question was, how much does the stock market make? So you already told me earlier that a typical bank account makes 2% a year, less if you're not in Goldman Sachs. Markets by Goldman Sachs. How much does the stock market return on average a year? There have been years that the stock market has returned 20%. 
for every hundred dollars you put in, you had one hundred twenty dollars. On average, how much does the stock market return? Anybody know? Five to six percent. But honestly, think about it. For every hundred dollars you have, do you all know what compounding interest is? No. Yes or no? No. Here's a hundred dollars that I have to invest. Okay? I invest. At the end of the first year, I have $105. Even if I don't invest anymore, I have $105. At the end of the following year, if I make 5%, I'm gonna have, I don't know, $6. Now I have 111. And at the end of the following year, even if I don't invest, but I make 5% more, that's what compounding interest is. You follow? It's interest on top of interest on top of interest. And the example I'm giving you is overly simplified because the interest you're making is, it could be monthly, it could be quarterly, it's usually not annually. So it's interest upon interest upon interest upon interest every month. That's true in your bank account, it's true in the stock market. Okay, does everybody understand what a mutual fund is? It takes your money, pulls it with other investors, sprinkles it across a suite of stocks, bonds, or stocks and bonds, okay? There are index funds that indexes your money across certain investments. There are stock funds that are just stocks. Um, you guys, there are sector funds. Let me tell you about that. Let's say you want to invest in energy, because there's always gonna be demand for energy, yeah? Gas, oil, coal, wind, nuclear, right? Why buy one stock and expose yourself to the risk of that one company stock when you can own every energy stock in the entire stock market? That's a sector fund, that'd be an energy fund, okay? So that's the beauty of the stock market, of, in, of mutual funds in the stock market. Cool? What did you say was interest on interest compound? Compounding interest. If you want to play with it, Google compounding interest calculator, and you'll get a whole bunch of different examples of it. You can play with like, if I have $100 and I'm making 5% on it, how much will I have in 10 years? I love to play with that. Compounding interest calculator. Okay, last slide, written question on next week's exam. Would you like me to tell you what the written question is? Yeah? yeah? Okay, I will. So the written question is, when it comes to your financial portfolio, so let's stop right there for a second. What is your financial portfolio? We just learned it tonight. What is your financial portfolio? Your steps you're taking. Give me them. Investment, savings. Your savings account first, that's your financial portfolio. Then? Retirement accounts, 401k, IRA, both. Then, what else is in your financial portfolio? Uh, savings account, yeah. Then, then retirement accounts, and then? Right, the non-retirement taxable accounts. Your stocks, your bonds, your mutual funds, whatever else that you have that is investments you made with your taxable money, okay? That's your portfolio. And then whatever else, the house that you own, the car that you own, the physical assets that you own, that's part of your portfolio too, okay? But this is your investment portfolio. Your savings account, your retirement accounts, and then your taxable stocks, bonds, and investment account, okay? That's your financial portfolio. Now, the question is, when it comes to your financial portfolio, explain diversification and timing. Okay? When it comes to your financial portfolio, explain diversification and timing. So, what do you want me to start with? Diversification or timing? Timing? timing. Well, let's start with timing. Timing equals your age. Your age and your distance to retirement. How old do you guys want to be when you retire? How old do you want to retire? Have you thought about it? Oh, 15 and a half, yeah. <laughs> On the nose. Probably like 55. Okay, even, even sooner. And remember, if you are gonna retire that early, 
you will not be able to touch a lot of your retirement accounts for another five years, four and a half years. Who else? Do you think about it? Sugar mama first, just for five years. I'm taking you on, but just for five years. Sign a prenup, <laughs> right? You cannot touch my retirement account. So, okay, maybe you haven't thought of it, and that's okay. You're young, right? But your age has to do with, or timing has to do with your age. How old are you, and how many years do you have to, to retire? Okay, when you are young, young, when I say young, I really mean 30s and 40s, to be honest with you. I'm not even talking 20s. Okay? I'm talking 30s and 40s. That's young, all right? When you're young, 80% of your money, of your portfolio, your money, should be in this. Give me another word for equity. 80% of your money should be in what? Thing to hold value. Give me another word for equity. Uh, Stock. That's it. And, and to Karina's point, sure, real estate, the home you own, stuff like that. But really what I'm talking about here is stock. The large majority of your total portfolio should be in the stock market. Why? As a young person, I'm a young person, I'm in my 40s, and the majority of my money is in the stock market. Why? Security. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I told you, I told you, what did I tell you guys? Well, let's get it on camera. What was my prediction? Let's get it on camera with the time. <laughs> what did I predict for you all? Um, crash. That there's going to be an economic crash. I don't know if I'm calling it a depression or a recession or just the GDP slowdown, but that crash is coming when? 2020. I feel that way. I feel that there's gonna be an economic slowdown around the election. I don't care who the winner of the election is, what party. Um, I think there's gonna be a reset there. And the stock market right now is so overvalued, it's so bloated, it's worth so much more than it really should be. So good to be true. Yeah, correct. And I think we're gonna see a correction around that time. But let's ride that wave for two more years. I'm good with it, for one more year. Or, no. <laughs> When's the election? November. This November. This next, November? Next November. No, next November, right. Yeah. Yeah. So let's ride the wave for another almost two years, year and a half, and we'll see what happens. Really? So I guess my prediction really is, yeah, November 2020. So we have a year and a half. Did I get that right? Year and a half. Okay. A year like two. Whatever. Yeah. Fine. Okay. A year. But as young people, <laughs> the majority of our money, look, this is our bank account, 10%. That's the rainy day fund, yeah? This is fixed income securities, and by the way, I have to explain to you one other kind of fixed income securities. We learned bond, bond is fixed income. I didn't teach you CD. I CD. Sam, can you see over my contraction? Uh, what's a CD? It's repaid. Good, it is a certificate of deposit. Is there a difference between a secured CD and a secured CD? Not sure. Secured. Explain to you what this is. This is really just a fancy savings account. That's really all it is. It's a fancy savings account. But it is a time deposit with a fixed rate of return. And penalty. Penalty if you withdraw early, but let me explain time deposit first. Certificate of deposit is an agreement that you're gonna lock your money up for a fixed period of time. How long? Three months, six months, nine months, one year, three year, five years. That's generally the times of a CD, okay? You are telling the bank, I'm going to leave this amount of money in this account, the certificate of deposit, for this period of time, and I'm gonna make a better rate of return. Why? Why will the bank pay you more for a CD than it will pay you for your regular savings account? Okay. Right. Boom. 
when you put money in your savings account, the bank doesn't know if you're coming back tomorrow. You ever do that? And <laughs> then put it in today, take it out tomorrow, right? Bank doesn't know, so it can't really count on that money being there. But with a CD, the bank is guaranteed that that money is gonna stay there. What does the bank do with your money? Loan it. Yeah, you got it. Loan it, lend it, circulate, okay? So that's the beauty of a CD. That's fixed income. We can count on it. That's guaranteed income, right? The bank is going to pay you money and it's guaranteed. Is that also hold for your credit? No, 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 that's just savings account. Nothing to do with like payments or anything like that. Okay, so young person. This is somebody in their 50s and 60s if they're not gonna uh, uh, retire until their 70s. If you all wanna retire in your 60s, then this is just your 50s. But look at the chart, what is starting to happen? First, compare the stock. What are we doing when we get into our 50s and our 60s? Uh-huh, what are you doing physically? You got it. You're selling your stocks. Why? Why would I in my 50s and 60s start to truly get rid of some of the stock that I own? That Under Armour stock that I'm holding on to for, I don't know how long, but long. <laughs> You're gonna dump it in your retirement. Uh, I may dump some of it just straight up into my savings account, to be honest with you. If I make $200,000 on my, uh, under Armour stock, I'm putting that money in my savings account, probably, okay? And then some other money might go into CDs or bonds or other safer things. Why? Why would a 50 or 60 year old want more of their money in fixed income safer things? Well, I mean, you can get sick and still invest in the stock market. It only, you know, takes a finger to press a button. It's just a superior return. Right because they have less time to ride a wave of downturn stock market. Okay, now watch. Here's the last thing. This is somebody that has just around five years, six years, let's say six years to retire. So however old that, whatever that means. Maybe somebody around, uh, I don't know, 660 or 65, okay? Look at where a majority of their money is. Let me tell you something I'm gonna say, it's gonna sound real mean. I'm gonna say it on camera even though it's mean. You kinda of can't feel bad for people who are getting ready to retire and then they lose everything in the stock market. You damn fool. How stupid are you if you wanna retire next year and a majority of your investments were in the stock market? That's what a 30 year old does, not a 70 year old. Somebody who's in their early 60s needs to exit the stock market for the most part. For the most part. You want some of it there. Why? Because if you don't, and then, oh my God, you live to 105, you're going to run out of money. The only way to really make your money continue to work is to keep some of it in the stock market. It's the only real way to make money, folks. Okay? You're never going to make enough money that you need just saving money in the savings account. Never, 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 never. never. The stock market is really the only true, almost real, like we could have a conversation about real estate. I'm not a big believer in real estate. I think real, I think you should own one home, your home. I'm not a huge believer in real estate because you're putting all of this money into one physical thing in one physical place. I'd rather own real estate investment trusts that I'm not dealing with tenants and fixing and leaky roofs and bullshit and rent and who, you know, has been done. What is real estate trust? Investment trust is just an index fund that invests in real estate projects, right? We just saw the biggest real estate project in the history of the world, Hudson Yards in New York City, 34th Street. It's the biggest real estate project in the history of the world. You wanna invest in real estate? Invest in that, mm. right? Not dealing with a you know, six-family house, you know, collecting Roaches. Yeah, roaches. <laughs> I was gonna say rent from tenants, but roaches too. Exactly. exactly. Okay, so let's answer the question and be done with it, all right? I don't think I've ever kept you this late. When it comes to your financial portfolio, we understand what our portfolio is, it's all the places that we have our money. Yep. Explain diversification and timing. Timing has to do with your age. When you are young, 
a majority of your money should be tied to more aggressive things like stock. When you're middle-aged, you begin to convert those things to safer, safer investments. Thank you. And by the way, don't be afraid to call your plain old savings account an investment. It's an investment. It makes interest. It's an investment. Okay. When you are five, six, seven years to retirement, the majority of your money should be converted to fixed income and cash. Not under your mattress, in the bank, okay? Do you know why I say six years? Because the stock market has ebbs and flows about every six years. About every six, seven years. Okay, so as a 40 something year old, I have lots and lots of six year roller coasters to ride. I'm cool. Okay, but a 60 year old does not. They may have one more. All right, so you want to make sure you're cashing out. Okay, now diversification, look, watch my fingers, simply means making sure your eggs are not in one basket. Not in one basket. Don't write that on the exam because you've got to explain what it means. Okay but just making sure that your eggs are, you're not gonna put every dollar you ever make into a savings account. Why not? Because you'll never make enough return. But you're also not gonna put your entire life savings in, in one stock, because that's for damn fools, okay? You put all the money you ever make in one stock and American Airlines goes out of business, we have a problem, okay? So you wanna make sure that you're diversifying your money, that you're putting it in lots of different places, all right? Questions. To, to explain diversification, you're putting your money, your money in. Spreading your money across various financial tools. How about that? What are the tools? Stocks, savings account, CDs, bonds, real estate, etc. Who else? Questions? All right may not have been interesting to your current self, but I promise you this will all be interesting to your future self, okay? As I am now my future self. Mm -hmm.